autorrecetarnos desde ibuprofeno hasta las benzodiazepinas? ¿Cuál es la correlación entre muchos medicamentos que usamos todo el tiempo y que te acabe dando demencia? Me encontré a un doctor en Pittsburgh que es anestesiólogo. Es un súper creador de contenido. Es un hombre de ciencia, pero también un hombre dedicado a la educación. Se llama Zain Hassan y está con nosotros para explicarnos cómo el uso prolongado de ciertas pastillas súper comunes que todos tomamos todos los días y no recetadas ha sido asociado con el riesgo de desarrollar demencia. My dear new friend, a man of science, welcome to the program and thank you so much for being here. How are you? Hi, how are you? So you're in Pittsburgh, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're in Mexico City. So what I was saying, you do understand Spanish, right? A little bit. Oh, you know, in Mexico, we have a strange way of dealing with, with medicine. Many people struggle to afford a doctor's visits or feel too busy to do that. So we tend to self-medicate, and it is so normal here that a study shows that almost 60% of Mexicans do it. And there are also studies on very common medications that may eventually lead to dementia. So tell me everything, Zane. Absolutely. So it's a little bit of a complicated topic, but the way that I think about it, and first, before I start, thank you so much for having me. Well, you know what I tell everyone? Even though this is a Spanish-speaking program, I feel it is my duty to find the best experts in the world, and I had the privilege of listening to your insights, so thank you for saying yes. Absolutely, absolutely. The way the way that I think about it, uh, Martha, is that The, your mind is kind of like a well-orchestrated orchestra, almost like a production every single day. Let's say the orchestra has 100 people total. Throughout the course of a production, maybe one or two of those people are not performing as well, and you need to replace them. And when you replace them, 98 or so of the performers are still there. Your mind kind of continues to go on. I, I, I kind of resemble or I kind of think about your mind the same way. If you constantly are replacing performers, eventually you're going to run out of performers and your entire orchestra is going to be different. It's oh kind of the God. same um, with medications that affect your mind, whether it's opiates, whether it's benzodiazepines, any of those medications that we take for anxiety, for depression, for issues day to day, um, once in a while are fantastic. They take care of those kind of spikes. But if you consistently take it over the course of 15, 20 years, um, just think about it as if you're numbing your brain over the course of a lifetime, and eventually your brain is going to change. And if you have ever had to take any of these medications that I talked about in my video that I talked to a lot of patients about, if you have to take these medications, typically you have to increase the dose every so often. So if you're Um, let's say you have, you know, some anxiety and they prescribe you a benzodiazepine like Xanax, which is oh my you know, readily available everywhere. Let's say they prescribe yeah. you that. Uh, if you take it once in a while, you know, if you replace one performer uh, before a big show, it's not going to really change the uh, outlook of the show. But if you're taking it every single night for, let's just say, five, 10, 15 years, eventually your brain is going to kind of become numb to the normal inputs. So how many times, Zane, have we discussed on this show Like uh, when a doctor called Dr. Reyesaro, our sleep specialist, uh, how many people rely on medications like Tafil, we say, Ativan, Valium, or Lexotan to go to sleep? And yeah, I know my meds, even Ribotril. Many of us have parents or grandparents who lived on Valium or Lexotan for years. And even today, people resolve many times their issues with these types of medications. So imagine the millions worldwide taking benzodiazepines freely. Absolutely. So benzodiazepines are very similar in their way, their mechanism that they work to alcohol. So they, if you think about it, they both affect the same receptors inside your brain, which are the GABA receptors, but they also affect those receptors throughout your entire body. So because of that, when you are, when your brain is normally functioning, you are interconnected bunch of neurons that are all firing at the same time. Benzodiazepines slow that down. So they slow down your neurons, how fast they fire. So it helps you relax. It helps your brain come down, but it also lowers your blood pressure. But if you think about it over the course of, you know, five, 10, 15 years, your brain is a muscle. If you're consistently slowing it down, eventually that brain is going to get used to being slow. And that's when dementia and Alzheimer's, these things start to creep in when your brain is not, not used to functioning at its full ability like it had been for the past 5, 10, 15 years. Eventually it reaches that breaking point. 
So now explain why prolonged use of benzodiazepines slows the brain down and eventually leads to dementia. Yeah. So uh, think about the easiest way I can kind of relate this is think about a prize racehorse that's uh, very strong, runs really fast. And then you take that racehorse and put it in a small barn or inside of a small caged area for five, 10, 15 years. Eventually that, you know, amazing horse is going to get weaker. It's not going to be as sharp. It's not going to be as strong, not as fast. If you think about your brain the same way, if you do not have your brain, brain is just like any other muscle in the body. If you're not consistently training it, consistently using it, you're going to lose it. Same thing happens with the benzodiazepines. As you slow down your brain over the course of 5, 10, 15 years to not have that excitatory um, synapses, that fire that caused the anxiety or caused you trouble sleeping, eventually the brain slows down. When it slows down, you have a buildup of certain proteins inside the body, which can lead to certain types of dementia. But overall, the, um, the similarities with all the dementias have to do with reduced use, usage of the brain, reduced mm-hmm. blood flow to the brain. Basically, uh, you can think of it as a injured shoulder or an arm. And as you get older, if you have one shoulder that's injured versus one shoulder that's good, you're going to see the one that's good is a lot sharper, bigger. It continues throughout the rest of your life. The yeah. one that's injured or slowed down or wrapped up going to be weaker. It's going to be more susceptible to disease processes. It's not going to have the same blood flow that it has, uh, that the other arm has. So that's the best way I can kind of explain it. It slows it down, weakens it enough, decreases the blood flow so that you are more susceptible to not only dementia, but other disease processes that happen in the brain, like we talked about. Okay. So listen to this story. A friend's mom who was told by her neurologist to stop taking benzos She used to take Nafil whenever she felt upset about anything and everything. And he warned her it could lead to a stroke. And sadly, she passed away from a stroke a couple of years later. Typically, benzodiazepines don't um, cause a stroke if you use excessive usage of it. The more likely scenario here is that the benzodiazepines regulate the blood pressure. And as you, um, you know, take it on, off, on, off, if you have uh, high levels of blood pressure, that can lead to a stroke. But more than likely, like we were talking about earlier, it probably has to do with if you're taking it over a long period of time, your, your body is very good at sending blood to the muscles that need it. So if yeah. your body is used to your brain not requiring as much blood flow, as much oxygen as it used to, it might decrease the blood flow there over a long period of time. Then if you have any insult, whether it's a yeah. high blood pressure, whether you yeah. fall and hit your head, whatever it is, your body will not be able to bounce back. You can have a stroke, you can have an injury, back injury, neck injury, whatever it is. Um, that would be the most likely thought process in my yeah. mind. But typically yeah. the yeah. benzodiazepines don't usually cause a stroke uh, just by themselves. Now let's talk about antihistamines like Benadryl, for example, which everyone uses so freely. I've taken it often myself and it's a great antihistamine. So Benadryl, very common medication used uh, by everybody. I don't know a single person who hasn't used Benadryl. I've used Benadryl very often myself. Now Benadryl works by decreasing the histamine release throughout your body. So when you have an allergy like to, you know, a certain food or seasonal allergies, it decreases the histamine that's released, which decreases the stuffiness, the dry throat, whatever's going on, or if it's a, you know, severe allergic reaction. One of the side effects of Benadryl is that it crosses the blood brain barrier. So unlike the second generation um, antihistamines like sertrazine or those kind of medications, Benadryl crosses the blood brain barrier. This causes somnolence, which is sleepiness. And a lot of people take Benadryl or NyQuil to go to sleep every single night. Now, I want you to just think about histamine is a a, um, molecule in your body to increase um, inflammation, but it also increases vasodilation to increase blood flow to your brain, right? Or to any part of your body. If you're having an allergic reaction, you do not want the blood flow to increase in your breathing pipe or that kind of stuff. So it's a fantastic medication for that. Using the side effect of Benadryl, which is sleepiness, uh, over the long course of, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, that, if you think about it, is going to decrease blood flow, also cause that numbing effect that we talked about with benzodiazepines, and that's going to lead to the same kind of trajectory, which gets you to dementia, Alzheimer's, trouble remembering things, those kind of things. Now, for everybody out there that has acid reflux, gastritis, talk to me about the proton 
pump inhibitors like omeprazole. These are very common for acid reflux and gastritis. Yep. So of all the medications that I listed, omeprazole probably has the weakest scientific data to say that it can or cannot cause dementia. The initial study that came out basically linked omeprazole with a buildup of these tau proteins, which are the proteins that are linked to dementia, Alzheimer's specifically. And the thought process behind the article um, and behind the research is that decreasing your stomach acid over a long period of time could theoretically cause this buildup of this protein. Now, the association and the link is much, much less than, you know, benzodiazepines and um, uh, opiates and those kind of medications. Yeah. But the linkage is still there. Um, but it doesn't yeah. have a clear defined scientific reason. A lot of people yeah. don't know that omeprazole is designed to uh, be taken in pulse dosing. So you're supposed to take it two weeks on at a time and then let your body recover and then take it another two weeks. You're not supposed to consistently yeah. take it every single day. But unfortunately, with our diets, the way they are, and because of a lot of the oils that we use, that everybody has acid reflux all the time. Okay, now let's open the file about antidepressants, especially tricyclics. So tricyclic antidepressants, these are the, uh, the last resort for uh, if you have depression, very refractory depression for a long period of time. The way I want you to think about these medications, they kind of uh, slow down everything in your brain. There's a uh, molecule called acetylcholine, um, which is a, a very necessary molecule to do any sort of uh, movements in your body. Any nerves in your body uh, require this molecule called acetylcholine. Uh, the tricyclic antidepressants, they kind of decrease those levels, not only in your brain, but through your body. And that leads to the same, uh, the same pathway that we were talking about, where you don't use your brain as much, the vascular you know, compromise that happens as a result, which then leads to um, uh, uh, um, dementia. But the one thing I would tell you is that these are the strongest um, of the antidepressant medications. They have a lot of side effects, a lot of side effects. And they're, if somebody is still on them, um, either you have really, really bad depression, anxiety, those kind of things, or you might want to talk to your doctor to kind of use some of the newer medications that are out there. Um, because this medication, like I said, affects your entire body um, and your day-to-day -day life. So it's not a good medication unless you really, really need it. So what about opioids? Who's taking opioids? Yeah, well, unfortunately I mean, in America. It, unless I'm, you're doing fentanyl, who's taking opioids? Yeah, yeah. In, um, I, unfortunately, unlike uh, Mexico, America, there's a, a lot of chronic abuse of opioids. Opioids work by a different mechanism. They affect a receptor called the mu receptor in the brain, which- uh, The what? Leads to, sorry? The what? The mu receptor, M-U. Mu. So it's a receptor okay. that uh, it's primarily for pain, but it, it, it's found inside your nerves and, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it does the same effect, but throughout your whole body, chronic use will slow down your brain kind of the same way, but opioids have another side effect, which is a, they decrease cognitive ability too. So they have like a global effect on your body. So when you take a, you know, like a fentanyl or any other morphine or any of those medications, um, they, they cause this fogginess in your brain. It's basically slowing down, you know, the same way the other, uh, the other medications slow down and, and, and leads to, you know, uh, leads to the same effects, which cause dementia. And I, and I would say that, you know, a, a common thread amongst all these medications, except for the omeprazole is that if you slow down your brain muscle, uh, just like any other muscle in your body, if you don't use it, you lose it. So whether it's your heart, your biceps, your legs, or your brain, once you slow it down for a long period of time, it'll eventually, you know, give in. Nobody loves opioids more than, than, than a doctor that does what you do. Cause when they put you to sleep, you usually, this is what you use. Yep. All the time. Exactly. And you know, there are studies that say that, uh, anesthesia, chronic use of anesthesia, um, affects the brain, um, even more when you put combined anesthesia plus the opioids, uh, there is, you know, studies say that it can, and especially in older individuals, when you get over 75, 80 years old, your brain doesn't tend to bounce back the same way yeah, that it used to. Glad, so. glad. Zane, thank you so much for this conversation. It was great having you on the show. Let's for sure do this again. Thank you for the information. Thank you for the education. And although benzodiazepines and all the medications that we talked about today are fantastic when needed and were prescribed by a doctor. It is so, so helpful to know how, even if they're so common, you still have to be careful. So thank you, my friend. A big kiss all the way to Pittsburgh. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure.